Um, my topic today is late life depression and I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. I thought I would show you this picture by Vincent van Gogh. Um, there aren't too many juniors here, but uh, if you want to describe the affect of a depressed patient, there you have it. It's interesting that the artist painted him in blue, which is uh, quite appropriate. And uh, the artist called this, um, sorry, I, let's see if I can get this right. Sorrowing old man at eternity's gate. Um, Van Gogh was actually a, a religious man and uh, believed in uh, evil and damnation and the uh, possibility of going to heaven. And so that was what drove him to uh, draw this picture. But he also himself, as you know, and I'll show you the next slide, he um, himself was severely depressed and finally committed suicide. He was born in Holland. Uh, at the age of 33, he went to Paris. He met Gauguin, Pissarro, and Monet, and all the famous artists of the time. And then he, with Gauguin, went to Arles in France, and they set up a new school of art, a, a style, a tradition of art. But during the time they were there, um, Van Gogh uh, chased and uh, threatened Gauguin with a razor, and Gauguin escaped. But uh, Van Gogh cut his own ear off, and this is the self-portrait of uh, himself after that happened. But then, at a quite a young age, 37, he finally he shot himself, and in his uh, note afterwards, he said it was for the good of all. Uh, so I think it's a very good description uh, of the affect in the first painting he did, and then this sort of uh, feeling of guilt and uh, worthlessness. So, um, my talk is about late life depression, and you would think, well, that's, is that true for him? Was he in late life? Well, you see, one of the main studies that I'm going to discuss was actually uh, based on a an age divide of 35 and older as uh, considered in that study as late life. But for most purposes and for most papers that you'll read, um, the uh, definition of late life depression is the age of 60 or higher. And then the real purpose of my talk is to bring to your attention the difference between early onset and late onset, because they, they, they are very important. And you really all, when you're assessing a, a patient for the first time who is in late life and, and has depression, it's important to distinguish between whether this is a first episode or a recently um, begun episode or have they a lifelong history of depression, because uh, it's the late onset depression is important to distinguish for reasons which I'll get to in a moment. Well, the prevalence of depression for all ages is somewhere between five and eight, but once you get to 65 and older, it's more than double. And it carries with it a quadruple risk for alcohol abuse. And when you look at suicide, once you get to 65 and older, the, the risk of suicide is higher, and it's especially so for men. For the uh, older age group, it's 14.3 in 100,000, but for the general population, it's 11.3. Not maybe a huge difference, but it is, again, clinically useful to be aware that depression and uh, suicide are more frequent in the elderly. So what are the risk factors for developing depression? Dementia, but again, as I develop the lecture, you will get to understand that it can also be a prodrome for dementia. 
So that being demented is a, a likely uh, precipitant for depression, but also once you, you um, it can be both a prodrome suggesting the later onset of dementia, but once you get dementia, you can get depression. So it's a mix of both. And uh, I think there's ev good evidence to say that people who get depressed after the beginning of developing dementia, they're quite often people who have a lifelong freedom from depression and then they start feeling depressed, but they're not quite aware of the memory problems. Of course, we know there are memory problems anyway in depression. So early on, it's hard to distinguish. And uh, the risk factors too, uh, myocardial infarction and the possibility of stroke. So then you look at it the other way, what conditions is depression increased in? And of course, Alzheimer's disease is one, and about 50% of Alzheimer's patients will have depression. I see quite a few people early on in the um, possibility of having Alzheimer's disease. And quite often, they're quite intelligent people, and they still have insight, and they come, and they're really worried about the fact that they're faculties and their memory starting to fade, and uh, they can have a, an understandable uh, depression and, and anxiety about it. But also, when you leave here today, you'll realize that for that type of patient who hasn't been depressed, once they start getting depressed, that could be the beginning of the actual the Alzheimer's. And again, I'll be coming in a few moments to some theories and thoughts about what could be causing both the early onset depression and then the later dementia. So um, in Lewy body disease, Parkinson's, stroke, PICS, um, folic and uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, they all have an increase in depression, but they also all have an increase in um, memory problems. And as I've said before, depression itself could be a, a, almost like a biological marker of the later onset of Alzheimer's. The study that I want to talk about most because it really illustrates the point I'm trying to make is this big study that was done in Denmark where they have a register where every citizen in the whole country has a the data is there for all of their uh, admissions to mental hospitals and the diagnoses and so on. And what they did for this study was they um, found 301 people who had just had one episode of depression. So they could be young, but they were having their first episode. And it was a, a very nicely designed study because they were able to, s to look at what's the difference between people to have an, a, a single episode. And they're young compared with people with a single episode who are old. Because after all, if you try to look at people who are old who had multiple episodes of depression, there's a confound in, in there. Of course, the age is also a confound. But that's the, the study that we're talking about. And uh, they found that of these 301, 99 were of early onset, meaning between 18 and 30. 202 were of late onset, 31 up to 70. And I thought some of the findings were, to me, surprising, but very interesting. Um, for early onset, what they found was that personality disorders were uh, more frequent than in the late onset and stressful life events, as you would expect. But here, I was kind of not expecting that the stressful life events would be the important uh, precipitant for the late onset depression. But I guess if you can understand or think about the fact that the brain's already somewhat compromised, stressful life events could uh, have a marked effect. And there were some things that were equally prevalent in early and late onset. The severity was the same, didn't differ. The outcome was the same. 
and the um, genetic component, the family uh, prevalence, was the same in, in both conditions. So I'll move on uh, to talk about treatment for a moment. Um, this is treatment of late life depression, is what we're talking about. And uh, with the SSRIs, the depression response is about 65%. And uh, they find that these other symptoms that you find in depression also respond irritability, aggression, anxiety. However, the adverse events are greater in the late life depression. Also, I think very interesting is if you look medication alone, you get a 65% response, but when you add social and psychological treatments, that improves up to 80 to 90%. So we psychiatrists tend to think, I think, maybe too much about uh, medication as the, the treatment. We are obliged to do that if we're only given 15 minute sessions and so on. But I think it's also important if we can include these other treatments. So then to look for a moment at what could be the explanation for depression, the first episode in late life, being a, a, a harbinger of uh, physical illness. Well, again, and maybe I think a surprising finding, APOE4 is not associated with late life or late onset depression. However, white matter and hyperintensities are associated. So if you look at the brains of these patients, they have more white matter abnormalities than would be expected in normal. Structural MRI is more often abnormal. Neuropsychological testing, I mean the patients come with depression and you, when you do neuropsychological testing you can pick up quite um, small but significant abnormalities that the patients may not be aware of. Inflammation um, is more common and neurotransmitters may also be part of the story, and, and again, I'll come to that in a moment. So, in late onset depression, the, we've already said that the deep white matter lesions are more prevalent, and when they are more prevalent, they are more likely to have cognitive impairment. And also, something that I find surprising, which is one of the reasons that it's nice to do a grand rounds occasionally because you have to catch up on all the latest literature. And uh, I was surprised to see that there's a, an increase in deep white matter lesions in bipolar disorder. And these are just speculations, but uh, the suggestion some people have made is that it might be a <coughs> cardiovascular uh, common entity and metabolic changes. So what are the structural changes in late life depression? More likely to have ventricular enlargement. I guess we're already aware that it may be the harbinger of dementia or Alzheimer's to come, and so maybe we're picking up the early stages of that. Sulcal widening, which again would be a finding in Alzheimer's. Frontal lobe reduction hippocampal reduction, and caudate reduction. These are all good studies that have reported these findings. What about neuropsychology? Um, what do we find there? Well, when you look, when you examine these people who have their late life depression, and it's the first, it's a late onset, you find that their episodic memory is reduced, their executive functioning is reduced, processing speed is reduced, and interestingly, all of these neuropsychological abnormalities, they continue even after the depression has been treated uh, successfully. Um, I don't think it's surprising, again, that these are the things you find abnormal, knowing that there's a likelihood they're going to go on to develop a, a biological or a physical illness 
following the Depression. Now, I mentioned earlier in the slide that, that inflammation has been suggested as a possible common denominator. And uh, what this slide is telling us that uh, in major depression, this IL-6 is increased, and uh, so it may suggest that this, and, and also you already probably all know that there are theories too about the development of Alzheimer's as being um, an, inflama an inflammatory process. And uh, some of the work that I've been doing in the last few years, uh, we were able to uh, see uh, inflammatory responses in, in some of the procedures that we were doing. So th there's a definite, uh, early, in, early in the development of Alzheimer's, the, there's an inflammatory process. And there's also evidence, epidemiological evidence, that people who are on uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, for example, for uh, arthritis, that that seems to be a protective factor for Alzheimer's. And then the question of neurotransmitters. Um, the low activity allele for serotonin for the promoter is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. So again, we're sort of connecting up the idea of something that is in happening in Alzheimer's but also happening in the development of depression. And as a result, these neurons are reduced in number, the serotonin, and the transporters are reduced, and the, upt the reuptake is reduced. So the, the, the summary is that serotonin is lacking or is, is reduced, which we know is what is thought to be one of the causes of depression. And I'm at my last slide, so I know it was a short presentation, but what is the take, take home message from all of this? Well, um, when you see one of these older patients, I think it's clinically important that you distinguish between is this the first episode or is it only a year or so since you had your first episode? Uh, and if the answer is it's a late onset depression, then immediately start thinking about an organic cause. And if you don't find anything, still be prepared to bring the patient back. Um, even if you treat, you remember, even when the depression is treated successfully, these other neuropsychological uh, deficits remain. So I, in my own practice, I would bring such a person back maybe in a year or six months and, and be thinking about possibly a development of a dementia. Okay, that's it. I'll Happy to take questions and hope I can answer.